Okay, I'm so glad you were all able to join us today for this very special program. We are going to have uh, a couple of things going on today. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Margaret Morin, who was instrumental in getting our guest speaker here today. And Margaret is going to introduce everyone, and she's going to open with a prayer. Margaret? We want to pray uh, before we do anything and thank the Creator for bringing you here and safely and, and Jackie. And um, so we're going to pray in the four directions, but I have a song. And the song is, um, and I see the star quilts. If you know what they mean, those are family quilts. And, um, and Jackie is family, and she's been my family for many, many years. And so I have a song for her, and it's called a uh, Family Unity Song. And uh, so this is for her, but I'm also praying in the four directions. And those of you who want to pray with me, you're more than welcome, but you know, you don't have to. But um, so this is, this is an old, old song, and actually it's a Dene song. An elder gave it to me years back in the early 90s, so I want to give her honor. But she, I know she is gone now, and um, she loved this song, and she wanted someone to sing this song, and nobody would do it in her tribe that was her family. And she said, Margaret, I would like for you to do it. And I go, I'm not the name, but I don't have the, the proper pronunciations of the words, but I will try. So I worked on it for about a month. She was from the Grand Canyon area, and, uh, you know, I remember her so well because she lived without electricity and wa running water for years. And that's how they lived it. Nothing bothered her at all. You know, she, that's, that's the way of life. So uh, this is a family unity song. And it goes like this. And we face the east. Uh, person in my life 
when I started uh, dancing and singing, and I reached out to a special sister, cousin of mine, and um, she's been, uh, she's grown so much. I've seen so, uh, the, the spirit grow so much in her. And I wish, I, she is such a blessing to children. You know that uh, that's her life. She loves the children. And to honor her, I don't have enough for, to say about her, because she's a teacher. She's a prayer warrior. No matter what you say to her, she always has something positive to say. And so I'd like to turn it over to Jackie Nunez from San Juan Capistano. years, but this play kind of looked like this. Um, my grandkids have been in it. <laughs> and my new friend Vinny, which is really my relative, Vinny, stand up. These are her relatives. And she's from my tribe, the Ahashima Nation. Those are her. Her uncle's there, her auntie, and her cousin. And we are the only uh, Native Americans in California that ever did a play that toured all over California. And from that, we made beautiful pictures, you know. And so we brought them here today, and eventually they uh, are going to be available for teachers. Like, there's something called Teachers Pay Teachers, and so they're going to be able to use a lot of the photographs. But more than that, um, the lady came to where we were doing the play, and um, we got it videotaped, and it went across, it went all the way up to Canada and across the nation. So this is our California version of earthquakes and the explanation of earthquakes. Me you friends. My name is Miss Jackie, and I'm from a California tribe called the Akashima Nation, the Wenenya Band of Mission Indians. And I'm here to tell you a very important story, a story that gives you a little bit of insight to our legends, because we know that earthquakes scare little children, but we want you to know our legends, so it might help a little bit ease that fear. And 
In a moment, when I tell the story, I want you to remember three words that will keep you safe because there will be a great shakeout and we want you to be ready. And the three words are drop, cover, and hold on. And in my language, we say, ama, gota, ya. Come, listen to the story. I think you'll really enjoy. A long time ago, there was just earth. It was just earth with a lot of water. There was no people, just the earth with water swirling. There were creatures inside, but no land. And Creator, as he came from a high place, looked down and he said, there must be land, to Mayawut. But how, how can I put some land on water? And just as he was thinking, a big tortoise came to the top of the water. And he looked and he said, hmm, that is what I'm going to use. And Creator looked at that turtle and he said, ah, brother, turtle, Baal, you have a great opportunity to do something wonderful for Tomayawut. And the turtle looked at him and he said, what can I do? We want to use the top of your turtle shell for the basis of land. But I need more than just you, little turtle. I need your brothers. And Turtle went back and he went and looked for all his brothers. It took a whole day for him to find one brother. And it took him another day to get another brother. And he searched all over the earth until he came up with his six brothers. And they stood before Creator and looked at him and said, Yes, Creator, what is it that you shall have us do? I am going to form land, which we shall call Tamayawood, and later it will be called California. Now, tail to head, head to tail. Come on, right now, put yourselves together. There you go, this way, a little bit that way, this way. Okay, perfect. That is perfect. Then he reached down in the depths of the ocean, and he brought up some soil, and he planted it right on the backs of the turtle. And he reached up into the heavens and he brought down a piece of straw and he made holes right in the soil. And as the soil received the stick, soon big, huge redwoods grew. They were tall, this tall. And he looked at it and he said, this is good. And then he got his fingerprints and he pushed and wherever he put a fingerprint, there were lakes. And then he took his fingers and he drew lines through it and there were rivers. And he liked what he had seen. This is good, he said. But then something happened and it wasn't good. The turtles, their backs got heavy. Oh, and they didn't like being the, the bottom of earth anymore. They were kind of tired. And, and the two top turtles said, I'm going east. And the bottom brother says, I'm going west. Come with us. No, I don't want to go your way. I want to go this way. And the brother says, I'm going to go that way. And pretty soon, they swam in separate directions. And before you know it, boom, there was a tremble. It was the first earthquake that was ever heard. Creator heard what was going on. And he came down and he said, Brother Turtles, what are you doing? I told you, you must be still. This is a great honor. You have to agree to be still or we won't have land. The turtles agreed. They thought about it and they said, yes, it is an honor. And they agreed that they would be still for the formation of California. But every now and then they get a little tired and they move just a little bit. And you feel that tremor, don't you? So what you're going to do is drop, cover, Hold on. And in my language, in our language, we say it this way. Ama. Ama. Kota. Kota. Ya. Ya. And that will keep you safe. And that will keep your family safe. And you don't have to be afraid during the times that California has earthquakes. <laughs> Tai hunu kaneshun eshun, tai hunu kaneshun eshun, na ha kwaneshun e ha kwa he, na ha kwaneshun e ha kwa he. 
Tai hunu kane shune shun Tai hunu kane shune shun Na ha kwa ne shune ha kwa he Na ha kwa ne shune ha kwa he Well, I'm so glad you came. I'm so glad we're here together. And I'm going to take you back in time to see what it was like to live with the people that first occupied Bakersfield. The people who first occupied all of California. Why, there are more than 117 tribes in California. And the tribe that I'm connected with is called the Ahashim. Can you say that? Can you say it loud and fast? God bless you. It sort of sounds like a sneeze, doesn't it? But it doesn't, it isn't. It means the people that sleep in a pile, the people that sleep in a heap. We lived in quiches, not teepees. That was from another area. But in California, we lived in huts. And we would cuddle together to stay warm, and by morning time, we look like a brand new batch of puppy dogs or kittens. <laughs> So here we go. We're going to take away some things. We're going to take away all the things that make us be in a hurry, like the clock and the watches and the computers and the television. They're gone. And the freeways are gone. And the buildings are gone. We're only left with water. We're only left with ocean and, and plants. And, and in my village, when we woke up, we saw the sun. And when we saw the sun, we did not take that sun for granted. But we looked up and we saw it and we knew it was a great spirit of light and warmth. And we reached up and we shook our head and we touched our heart. And we said, ah, uh -huh, you are back again. And then our day began. <laughs> and we had to do everything. Oh, we had to find food. Now, how many here think that most uh, California Native Americans ate corn. Raise your hand. Okay, she, okay. Well, take that out of your memory. Throw it up to the ceiling and leave it there. Because we didn't eat corn. We actually ate the little seedy, tiny seed that drops from an oak tree. It starts with an egg and shit looks like a two. What is it? Acorn. And acorns have to be gathered. And when we gathered the acorns, we needed baskets. And in order to get baskets, well, we needed plant material. So I'm going to say the names of the plants, and you're going to say them after me. Juncus, deer grass, willow, willow, tuli, tuli. yucca. <laughs> Not yucky, I said yucca. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> I have a picture of yucca up upon the stage there. And that yucca was the most important plant of all California Indians that were pretty much throughout the state. And they were found in different ways, but that was a fibrous plant. That was a plant that we could gather. And, well, put out your hand just like this, your arm, go like that. And pretend like you have a rock, and let's pound it. Come on, you gotta pound it. And, and rinse it in the creek, and you gotta shake it out. You have to do that about 50 times. <laughs> and after you do, you're left with fibers that have no chlorophyll in it. And these right here made rope and string. And these right here were so important because they started every basket that I have on my table. And they also made something else, the first platform sandal ever worn in Southern California. A little itchy, but it sure protected your feet. And so when we made these, um, just pretend that you're taking a few little pieces from me, and you have to tie them in a knot. That knot is the beginning of every basket that's here today. Now we're going to weave a little basket. So what we're going to do is we need another plant called juncus. Juncus is tall and skinny. It's like a straw, but we have to pull it up out of the ground. So I want everyone to grab it just like this. Come on. And at the count of three, I want you to pull it up out of the ground, but don't forget to make this out. Oh, this is really hard to pull out of the ground. So here we go. One, two, three. And then you're going to flip it around. And this is the part that was in the yard. Take your thumbnail, and I want you to kind of, we're going to split it in three. Come on. 
oh, my little friend there, he's really working hard, perfect. <laughs> and so that chunkus goes like this, all into three pieces. And one piece is going to be pinched right here. So pinch right here, come on. And then the other one is pinched right here on this side, come on. Now we have a third piece, where's that going to go? Right here. Between your teeth, right there. Okay, so now we're going to separate our hands very slowly. And as we separate our hands, we are going to have three fine pieces of junkus to do some sewings in our basket. One, two, three, slowly. So those are some of the plans that we, you know, um, we would use to make our basket. Now, after about six hours, that's a long time. How big do you think your basket might be? Show me with your hands. Let me see. So, oh, she's right on the right track. Yeah, you're right on the right track. Okay, so some of you have done some basket weaving. Because when I go to schools, the kids are going, huh? But actually, they're about this big right here. And the most beautiful basket that I have here today is this one right here, because this right here was made in the traditional way that we made baskets 10,000 years ago. So this is one of my most beautiful baskets made by a famous basket weaver named Abe Sanchez, who also made my basket hat. So I'm going to go ahead and let your energy and love be placed into this basket, and we'll pass it around, okay? So what, when we went to go get the baskets, but there's one particular basket that we need to actually gather. And it's over here. Oh, there it is, right here. So finally, we have made another basket that's perfect for gathering acorns. And it's in this shape right here. So this right here is slung over your shoulder like that. And then when it gets heavy, then we put it over our basket hat just like that. Now. I want everybody to say two words. Say old knees. When you have old knees, you can't squat down and pick up acorns anymore. So I'm going to ask one of my young girls over here. How about you? This one, will you come up and help me? Come on. Perfect. Beautiful little young lady. And we're going to put this on your head, and you know how to squat. You're going to squat and pick up a couple of acorns for me, but if I got down, we need you and we need my grandkids to pull me up and it'd be a sight for sore eyes. So we're going to put it right there. And this hand will hold it on, right here, this one. And then I want you to squat all the way down, squat down. There we go. And then you come up, I think I heard those knees the hawk. <laughs> okay, then come on up. And then you kind of move over there and go get some more. And so our life of gathering acorns was the whole entire family, but the young ones were the best gatherers because they had young knees, right? <laughs> Thank you. Tell everybody your name. I'm Cassandra. And she's Shumash, so let's give her a big hand. Thank you. So we would gather the acorns, and then there was a long process to making um, acorns. What's so interesting is, is when I started my story, and my story started because I was defending my children. Um, I got my great kids here, and my one son, grandson, he's chosen to have the Indian here. Just show him your long hair, Jared. So there's my grandson, and he's got beautiful hair, and well, thank you, Jared. And my kids also wore their long hair, and when we moved down to San Juan Campus, turned out the kids were making fun of them and they wanted to cut their hair. they kind of go like this with scissors all the time. And my kids came home and they said, we don't like this school. We want to go home to Pop one day. And that's where we had moved with my, when I first got married with my husband. And I said, no, I'm going to go to that principal. I'm going to talk to that principal in a nice way. And I'm going to tell them right across the street from your school, there's a mission. And there were people that built the mission. And we have a history. And our history is significant, and I want to come and I want to present to you, children. And that day, I went, and I talked to 600 children, and I told them our story, that we were the builders of the mission in San Juan Capistrano, and having our long hair was one of our traditions. The only time that we would cut our hair is if someone passed away, and then it was an honoring. And in the ancient times, when people would see you with short hair, they'd say, oh, and then they would hug you because they knew that you were mourning. What a beautiful way, in a physical way,
way that we knew that there was pain to lose someone that you loved. And after that day, I did assembly one, assembly two. Someone went down to Indian education and they told Joel Wilson, we don't know who this Indian lady is, but you better come and see her. And he came and saw me and he hired me that day. And my story continued to grow. I took my children with me and um, it was interesting because during the course of telling my story, sometimes the children would laugh. They would laugh at some of our things. And one day my youngest child came home with his shoes in his hand and he wanted to walk in the door, but he said, that's it! You said I was gonna feel special if I went to go tell these stories and I don't feel special. All those kids are laughing at all of our special things, mother. And my heart was broken. My heart was, and all you parents out there, you know your heart would be broken too. So when that happened, I realized that something needed to be done about laughter. I encouraged a friend of mine who was a child psychologist to come and to watch me do my presentation. Sometimes I'm trying to be funny and I want to get some laugh. But there are times when I show things like this, that's a very serious, beautiful object. And the kids go, ew! Silly, oh, look at that thing. And they laugh at something that's a treasure. And my psychologist came and she watched me. She says, you know what's going on, Jackie? And I go, no, I tell me. She says, children are feeling uncomfortable with things that are different. And when children feel uncomfortable, they go, ha, ha, they laugh. And you know what? That happens today, doesn't it? We begin to look at differences. And because it's not part of our family values, we laugh, we point, we make fun, and it's really not okay. Because every human being deserves to be who they are in the world. And so I tell these children, I'm gonna show you this right now. And as I show you this, you have two choices. You could laugh or learn, but I want you to know that the reason why you're laughing it's because you feel uncomfortable. There's sort of an uncomfortable feeling inside. Even adults do it. Can you imagine? Your house is a mess. Your mother-in-law calls you up. I'm coming over. And you go, oh, oh sure, just give me 15 minutes, okay. And when you open the door and the house is still a mess, you go, oh, hi. Oh, it's so great to see you. But really, you're kind of nervous inside. And that's what happens to kids, too. Incidentally, it would never happen. But um, that's my daughter-in-law. Her house is immaculate. Um, but what happens is children laugh at differences. And so part of my story has been to help them to feel more comfortable, to help them to know that there's a lot of differences in the world and they deserve respect. So I'm going to teach you just like I teach them.